when my daughter was like 12 years old, she was in a science fair, and she decided to do an experiment <clears throat> to test the speed of sound relative to the air temperature outside. So she ran, we lived out on a farm, and we had, you know, we were like a couple hundred yards apart, or maybe a hundred yards apart, <clears throat> and like we'd make a sound, and she would see us do it, and she'd record the sound with the, you know, stopwatch, you'd write it down. And we did it at different temperatures and stuff. So finally, the day of the uh, science fair, she had her thing set up, and she had all the results. And uh, one of the judges said, your results are not anywhere consistent. You know, what did you learn from this? And she, had, she said, I learned that experiments don't always go well. <laughs> so, and actually, she got an award at the science fair for that. They're like, that's a great, that's a great part of science. Like, ex experiments, they either give you the result you may have expected or, the, or not, or they just don't work well. That's kind of where this talk is. <laughs> I had a lot of stuff go wrong the last couple days, um, from VMs crashing to losing source code because someone um, didn't put it in Git before they sh should have. Um, so, so this is the reality television of demos. So if we, were you here for the opening keynote? The one red hat guy said, we all came to see demos that will crash and burn, right? Or was that, was that Todd that said that? Sure. Yeah. Well, I am, I'm, that's why I'm here, to crash and burn for you, to see it all crash and burn. So I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. There's a few things I could have fixed, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to let them broken so that if you come across this, you can have the same frustrations I had. And uh, it's just more real. But at the end, we you know it works great, and we're all happy. But I'm not, I'm not uh, <laughs> there's no smoke and mirrors. It's more difficulty than success. So some of you are .NET developers. Have you messed around with, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, .NET on rail at all? OK, yeah, there's red hat guy in the back. <clears throat> Other than that, have you messed around with the .NET Core on Windows? Thanks, Todd. OK, it's a brave new world. Um, wasn't that Aldux Husley that wrote that? So .NET and containers and Java. I, and I picked Java because it's a Java conference. It could just as easily be Node or Python or Ruby if you're a hobbyist. Um, but that was, that was a joke. But it really is different. I mean, think about this. I mean, here we are at a, a conference talking about open source and Microsoft in the same breath. And I, it, I just, I never get tired of it. it I can't, I just still haven't gotten my head around it. Uh, let me just back up a little bit. My material is, doesn't fill an hour, so I can, I, can, uh, I can just rant and all that stuff, vamp and all that. I, I got into the open source world about, Three years ago, I, I grew up in a Microsoft environment, and you know lived in that side of the neighborhood, and everything was hunky dory, and the, the the nice fences and the finely trimmed lawns, and just thought that's how the world was, and you know nothing ever changed until Microsoft said, hey, you know we have we've come down from on high, and here's a new version of software that is better and actually works, and then, of course that was a lie, but but we believed it, you know there was always problems. And I just, that's what you did. I, I, I got into Visual um, .NET when it came out. I got into Visual Basic when it came out in 1991. <clears throat> so I'm happy as a clam doing all this stuff. And I was working for a company that they, you weren't allowed to use open source. This is my favorite open source story. Because it's, it's one of my only ones. But So I got some open source JavaScript code. And I included the file on my project. Right, it was ASP.NET website, intranet. And I, everything worked great on my PC, so I sent it over to like, the testing guys. And they pushed back and said, hey, well, you can't use this file, this JS file, because it's open source software. And I said, well, what, well it's not supported. I said, but it doesn't matter. First, it's JavaScript. It's not like it's like, binary, right? We have the code. 
And I was, they said, no, you can't use open source. So I went to my desk, I copied the part that I actually needed, one function, I pasted it into my ASPX page, and sent it back to, to testing, and it was fine. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's when I thought, you know what, this is like crazy, there's this whole world out there, and, um, and it's just waiting for us. And so now, as we all know now, .NET is, is now open source, and by now, open source, I mean, it's been, you know, okay, SPNet was, and they had mono, but now it's like the real thing. And of course, it runs on Linux. And installation is fast as e and easy. Is there anyone here who hasn't installed this? Oh, come on. On Linux? Is there anyone here who hasn't installed it on Linux? <clears throat> okay, you remember the old, do you remember installing it on Windows? And just the huge downloads, and it would take forever. Well, now it goes really quickly. And what used to be take forever to install. I just, I just love this. I can't type today, folks. I, that's wrong. Now when you install it, it's just a command, and, and it goes. And that's, I mean, this will run a little bit. I'll vamp. But you, you, if you remember the old, do you remember getting the, the CD and stick it in the drive and doing the install and waiting? And you, yeah, well, .NET came on my server. Yeah, but then when you got an upgrade, maybe you downloaded it, and you did this huge download, and then you run the MSI file, and you did the install. Now, there you go. It's installed. That's the first big benefit I see. Well, this is about containers. Why does that matter? Well, we, do you want to do a Docker build and sit there and wait for two hours for the thing to install, or do you want it to, you know, install rather quickly? So that's the first advantage of it right there, right off the bat. We're talking about containers. It installs really quickly. Now, having said that, you're going to have a Docker image, right, that has rel on it. So it's not that big of a deal, but incremental improvements tend to compound. So that's one of them. By the way, I'm running Windows on a Mac, so any kind of wonkiness is because of that experience. <clears throat> so installation is fast and easy. That's the first thing that's really cool. And we just saw that. So there, we all know by now the big three commands, right? .NET new, which builds a worthless command line program that you'll never use, and then .NET restore, and .NET run. I don't have new in here, because restore, if you're familiar with that, it pulls down libraries from nougat.org. Libraries, DLLs. Remember, we called them that. It doesn't have to be nougat. An important thing to remember, if you are working in an enterprise environment, it could be a shared you know, a, a folder on your server. It could be in the cloud somewhere, whatever. It doesn't have to be. You can have a private repository for your code. That's nice. <clears throat> nice way to share bits. Build is still important. It, if you just do run, it does a build. But you're probably going to want to do a build at least the first time so you can check like, if it works or not. And the cool thing about doing a .NET build is you have command line options. Now, there's a good example. It's going to skip the compilation because it's already compiled. When you do a build from certain projects, the easiest thing for me is just to go here and show you this. And of course, it's on GitHub. There's an example program they showed you called Music Store, which we're going to do some stuff with later. But Music Store was written with Windows in mind. So if you bring this down, and put it, if you clone it, and if you fork it and clone it to your PC, and open it in code, code comes up and says, hey, you wanna, you're missing some, how is that? Some assets, like the launch.json. Do you wanna do that, you know, do it? It's just like, sure, create it automatically. Well, 
because of the way this is configured, it's going to create it for Windows. It's going to the build is going to try to build an EXE because this was written with Windows in mind. If you look at the project.json file, that's what I wanted to show you here. You're going to find that it, it's slightly different, and those things can break your projects, but not break it. It just won't work. In other words, it's not broken per se. It's just not working because there's some steps you need to know. Down here, see this net 451? Well, that's great. That's .NET 451 for Windows. And then below that, you have net core app 1.0, which is the, like you want for Linux. Well, when you build this on Linux, it's going to do two builds. It's going to do both of them. And the first one, you're going to get, <laughs> I know this, you're going to get 81 error messages in red scrolling off your screen because it's trying to use like Windows libraries in Linux, and that doesn't work. I mean, you can, right, they're specific to Windows. So when you do a build, you can specify the framework. Now, why is that important? Well, the first time I put this in a container, let me show you the Docker file. Easier shown than said. When the, um, I love PowerShell, but I don't always get in. There we are. When you, uh, I can't talk and type at the same time. The first time you run the Docker file and it does a .NET build or .NET run, it fails because it's going to do that, remember that .NET 451? It's going to hit that. It's going to kick out an error number like a 127. And so your build's going to fail. And when you put it, for example, in OpenShift and it tries to build it, it fails. Even though if you run at the command line, if you do a run, it does a build, it fails, it does the next build, which succeeds, and then it runs. But you don't have that luxury in your Docker file of fail and then succeed. When it fails, it's like, okay, I'm done, it failed. So you either have to change your build to have dash dash framework and specify it, or you take that out of your project.json. So that's one of the little gotchas of things you have to know. If you get a project from someone, you want to watch for that. That was the first thing that I was like, what is going on? I know this runs. I ran at the command line, and it's not working in Docker. And you could watch it in Docker. Building, building, fail. And when you do it in um, VS Code, it does, it'll do the same thing. It'll, you know the error message you get when you do a build? It says it, it, it failed, but do you still want to debug it, and you still want to run it? Remember that? And then you always say no, because you know. It'll say it failed. Do you want to continue? And if you say yes, it'll do the next build, and I'm talking in Linux now, which will succeed, and then it'll launch the application, and you have your debugging ready to go in VS Code. So that, you have to know that. If you're, especially if you're coding in a mixed environment where you might be doing like Windows and Linux and .NET, so even though, though all the hype was, hey, this is all great, it's all here, it runs on both platforms, it's true, it does. But there are still things you have to be, you have to have knowledge of. <clears throat> I would like, I would think the way to handle it would be maybe build a script that tests for the operating system and then does the right build. I had a, um, shoot, where was that? Anybody here use OpenShift? So there's S2I, right? Source to image. Well, there's an S2I-ASP.NET that you can get on GitHub. And it, it does the source to image build for ASP.NET. It's awesome. But the assemble script, if you're familiar with those, it, it basically, it's a .NET restore and .NET build. Well, it was failing because it, it doesn't build for Linux. It just does a build. So I had to tweak it to do a .NET build for, for Linux. So that's something you need to be aware of. Three big commands, they have their own thing. So we, we've all seen the Hello World app, right? Do you, 
you know, you just .NET new and you get hello world. So I won't do that. But I'm in the wrong machine. But here, there's a there's a hello web application. It's a little bit better. Here's the problem you have right now. You can do the .NET new and you get a, a console app, but what if you want to do an MBC app? Then what do you do? I mean, how do you, seriously, in Linux, how do you get that? My only success has been either do it in .NET uh, Visual Studio on Windows and then copy it over and start doing some manual porting. Um, I have started, if you're familiar with Yeoman, I, have, I am working on a Yeoman template to do an MBC app. That's really helpful. And there's a website called live.aspnet.com. And every Tuesday at 6.45 Eastern time, they have the community stand-up. That's good to know. And a few weeks ago, they said that they're, the tooling for the templates, I guess they're T4 for templates, if you're familiar with that. But the tooling for templates is coming. So the new .NET model you know, is, is layers and the tooling's at the top. It's no longer built into .NET, it's built into the tools. So you do a .NET restore, .NET run. <clears throat> so the, so what, are we, what are you showing us here, Don? I'm showing you just a, that you can do a web app. And you, so there's the hello world, the web. All this code is up on GitHub, you can get it. <clears throat> And this works well in, in, a, in a container. So the music store demo we saw the other morning, and it, it probably ad nauseum by now, but it shows ASP.NET, MBC, Entity Framework. It does use SQL Server when in Windows, and someone on our team has it, SQL Server running in Linux, demo of it. So that's great. If you saw the source code, there's a module called Sample Data. It has all the, it's in Music Store, right? Albums. It has all the albums in like 400 lines of code. So the idea was, let's take that and put it in a MySQL database and then write a Java uh, service that just, kind of a microservice. All it does is read from the database. There's no update, delete, create. That's all it does. Which is nice, because if you think in containers, it scales well. Maybe if you have a website and there's, uh, for some reason, you're getting hammered with people looking at stuff and not too many people buying, why scale up the shopping cart stuff when all you need is the inquiry? <clears throat> so and then run that and then take this and get rid of the sample data and have it read from the Java service. And then do it all on OpenShift. And then that way, you know, it just shows that it actually, it's not smoke and mirrors. So, the music store. And we, I, again, we've all seen this, let's see. Can you see that uh, text on the screen? Can, you, can anybody, can you see it? There's one called Jumpin' Jack Flash. I, I now name all my GitHub repositories related to the Rolling Stones. <laughs> so I have one called Sympathy for the Devil, Jump Jack Flash, one called Negrita. <clears throat> so this is in RHEL, as we've all seen this. And I'm running this so that when you see it in RHEL and then you see it in OpenShift, there's no difference. And we all know, we'll expect that. That's how it should be. But I'm just big on the real world. It either works or it doesn't, and there's no, you know, I'm not showing you animated images. I'm not gonna say GIF or GIF. So there's errors, which is just great. What does that mean? That means if you have code that you wrote three days ago, it might not work now. Again, I, earlier today, I, I had this error, and I, I was gonna fix it, and I thought, you know what, I'm not gonna fix it. I'm gonna let it go and let you see that 
If you've been doing stuff up till now, you may have this issue. If you're starting now, you'll be fine. You won't have to deal with this stuff. But just know that you're not alone. If you've come to the open source world like I did from this walled garden of Microsoft where everything pretty much worked, and then you come into open source where things change rapidly, it doesn't mean that it's worse. It just means you have a responsibility to make sure things don't change, right? Make sure they still work. You know, don't just go grab the latest bits because, hey, they're out. Maybe you want to you know, test some stuff in a sandbox. That's an important thing to know if you're, if you're a .NET developer that came from Microsoft World strictly, because that is, that is a big change. And it's been, quite frankly, it's been hard for me to, to, to grasp that. And that's related to this whole subject of containers, because now you have .NET changing, you have Docker changing, or whatever containers, run C, whatever container system you're using, and open, I mean, you have to really, it's like keeping 15 ping pong balls underwater. You have to really watch what you're doing. So the music store Docker file, I guess I could bring that up. The music store Docker file has um, some interesting stuff. What am I doing wrong? There we go. The other thing I want to point out here, um, the, the yum and st stall stuff, that's gone. That's not, you don't need to do that in your Docker file. You just do a from your image. <clears throat> Originally when I did this, I had the, my command was .NET restore, ampersand .NET run. So it would restore it and run it for the command line, right? If you're familiar with Docker, right? That's, so what's the problem with that? It would reload every time you restart it, which means you don't have immutable infrastructure. That, that totally violates the whole idea of the container. And it, it, I did it a few times before, I was like, duh. Because I was pulling bits down on Monday, and I was pulling bits down on Tuesday. And this was when you know, things were so flexible. I, one day I went to dinner, and I came back, and something broke. Literally, which was fine, then that's the nature of development. But if you're doing that, every time you run it, you're restoring possibly different libraries. And the whole idea of an image is that they're all the same. So again, .NET and containers, you, these are the kind of things you need to be sensible of. And it might seem, you know, you might sit there, well, I know that. Well, somebody in the room besides me might not think of it, so hopefully it helped you. And there's the .NET run. Remember I said to build, you can specify a framework. You can do it on the run. And this is a good example of why you would want to do that. So that if you got code that had the project, remember the project JSON, the Net 451? If I got that project and tried to run it in my Docker file, it would work because the run command, which will build if necessary, specifies the framework. So if you give me that project that's built for Windows and RHEL, or or, however you want to look at it, it'll work here. That's something to keep in mind. I know this isn't a real exciting session, but if you think about it, this stuff should be pretty boring. It, 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 I mean, really, you don't want code to be exciting when it's running. It should just be, it should just work. So we don't need to see this. Well, let's get to this. I'm, so, so <laughs> Raphael is sitting up here from Red Hat. He has a microservices demo, and there's one called Guest Book. Was anybody there last night for the Kubernetes thing? It was, I thought it was excellent, right? I thought it was great. Well, the Guest Book application is a CRUD application that read, write, update, a guest book, as you will. So I'm not really a Java developer. I've, did enough to be dangerous, but I'm really good at um, search and replace. So I did a search and replace for guest book, and I changed it to album, and then I went to you know, the stuff that we all could do. I changed the MySQL sta statement to have more fields like title, genre, artist, price, um, album art, URL, 
basically, I took his code and, and <laughs> copied it and changed it so I could use it. So um, that's what that is. And then my little cheat sheet, because Raphael is an expert on OpenShift, and I'm learning it as a .NET developer. And last night, by the way, was great, because Kubernetes, I, you found out there's a great correlation between the Anyway. I built the Music Store app, you know, exposed the service and run that. There's a SQL in there. I got the, you know, the password set and all that. And the album lister, that's what I called the Java. It's, it's a lister of albums. It's just read only. So that's my little cheat sheet for the uh, OpenShift stuff. You don't need to, you know, memorize that. I'm just showing you kind of the thinking that went into it. So if I go in and, and open my OpenShift, is that it? There it is. Console. This is pretty cool. I like this view. So I have the Java program that I uh, got from Raphael and modified, running as a service. And in fact, if I go over here, let's see, Album Mister, that's it right there, right? And then it's um, API.albums. So instead of the code being hard coded in the music store, now it's pulling it from a database. <clears throat> so again, you know, it's a JSON docs, no big deal. But that's pretty cool because that's what you want to see. You have, you know, dogs and cats living together type of thing. You have Java and .NET. Again, this is just showing you that they're actually there. I have. The, the MySQL, never mind the one on the bottom, that's a vestigial thing. But we have the MySQL container running, which contains the data. And then up here we have the music store. And so the, the very uh, anticlimactic part of this is that's the music store we saw earlier. There it is running in OpenShift, hitting the Java service to get the data. And again, it's pretty boring because it's like, well, there's, so what? It's no different. But that's the point, isn't it? I mean, that's exactly what the point is. It, it's, it should be totally transparent. God help us if it's not transparent. So you can, you know, you can scale up in that. Now I have two of them. I do want to say, I want to apologize. What I should have done was I, I should have had an album that came back that had like the host name so we could prove that they were, but if you used OpenShift, you know it's hitting both of them. I mean, that's just the nature of the business. That's not, as a developer, that's not my problem. That's, that's a problem for the OpenShift people. I mean, seriously, that's their responsibility to make sure it does that. And that's pretty much what I have. Again, it, it wasn't supposed to be real exciting. The whole idea is you're like, well, that was kind of easy. It's exactly. It's supposed to be kind of easy. It's not something that you want to be scratching your head. A few little gotchas with the Microsoft uh, Windows and RHEL, and they're not, they're not break. You don't have to break anything to fix it. You just have to be aware of it. It's a consideration. Uh, you know, when you, when you go out in the rain, it doesn't hurt you, but an umbrella, it's a consideration, something to think about. Well, that's how this is. There's the website. Um, I mentioned Yeoman. That's a tool to build, uh, build software. It's a great tool. There's AutoRest. Are you familiar with AutoRest? If you're not familiar with this, this is really slick. It's for Azure, basically, but you can use it. I've used it outside of Azure. AutoRest allows you to take Swagger to define your API and automatically build a RESTful client. And it works with C Sharp. I think it works with Java. It works with Ruby, Python, Node. It's a fantastic piece of software. So avail yourself of these things until the tooling comes up. You're probably going to want to do is use that, or you're going to open Visual Studio in Windows and create a new project, and then take that over to your Linux. You know, go, push to GitHub, pull it down, and tweak it for Linux, and then build your Docker file, and you're ready to go. Right. And Microsoft has said 
they will support F sharp, and they will support VB, <laughs> Visual Basic, which I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't be a language snob about VB, but they're, they're going to support F sharp and VB. Um, one of the things to think about, when you build a f a, um, an application, you can build your Linux, Linux box and it creates a DLL. When you do .NET run, it's just running the, it's just, how can I say it? It's running the DLL, so to speak. So you can put that on a thumb drive, pull it out, stick it in a Windows machine, and it works. It's exact, without, with no modification. Once you have the DLL, that runs anywhere. No. It just puts it all in. It puts them all in. <laughs> Couple, two things. Look at the image size. <laughs> Do you see it on the, on the far right? For the music store, it's 1.7 gigabytes. Right, that right there, that's a little like, hey, why is that so? It's because of what you said. It's, it packages everything up. In fact, you can do a build and build an EXE, and all it does, you know, a standalone EXE. It's like, hey, that's cool. Well, it just takes the runtime, the CLR, and bundles it all up. So when you do, like I said, when you do a .NET run DLL, because you can do that. You can say .NET run, and you can specify a path to a DLL and run just that DLL. Like, it doesn't have to be the one right where you are. When you do the EXE, it, bun it just takes, when you did the run, it's like, well, I'm going to use the common language runtime to do it. It's just, it's just put all that in an EXE. So when you say EXE, it runs the CLR that runs the DLL. That's what it's doing. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out, <clears throat> and I know there's not a lot of .NET devs in here, where I live in central Pennsylvania, it's a very uh, industrial area, and it's, it's like big company heavy, you know what I mean? Like it's a lot of big companies that employ people. It's not a lot of small businesses. And those developers, I go to the user group, and one of the things that they're missing is the .NET Core. It, this is not like a branch off of .NET. This is the future. Like this is where it's going. Microsoft has stated, you know, we have 4.6.1.2. There'll be bug fixes and stuff. But the future of .NET is .NET Core. I mean, we're, you're not. It's not something to shy away from or think, well, I don't need it. It's something to embrace and say, well, why not? And, I, and someone asked me, why do I care as a .NET developer about this? Why do I care as a Java developer? Why do I care as a company? Well, if you're a .NET developer, you care because it's going to give you the opportunity to run your code on different platforms, right? Mac, Linux, Windows. And that's just a great place to be as a developer. Anything that makes you more versatile and useful as a developer I mean, let's be honest, you can get paid better. I mean, it's just, that's the bottom line. I mean, yeah, you might like it and stuff, but that's a, that's a nice benefit to be more valuable. As a Java developer, why do you care? Because you're going to start bumping into .NET developers at conferences, and you have the opportunity to share open source stories and community. And, and this tool, you know, we use, we use Team City. Oh, that's cool. We use Jenkins. What's Jenkins? Oh, well, it's a build you know, a CI, CD pipeline tool that you could use. I use uh, Go, anybody heard of Go.cd? It's by ThoughtWorks, right? That's a whole nother one. So that's what I'm saying. There's all this opportunity to learn and give and take. And you're going to run in as a job, Java developer, people on your team that are going to start doing .NET stuff. And then you're going to be like, oh, OK, they're not two-headed freaks. I understand where they're coming from and how this works. And as a company, it's valuable because now your pool of talent is bigger. If you're like, well, we're going to do microservices, you're not limiting yourself to Ruby or Java, or now you're like, you, you have a whole, what, I think if someone said there's 9 million .NET developers, is that in the United States or the world? I think it was you that told me that. Anyway, even if it's, that's a lot of programmers, a lot of developers to have available to you. So it, it, the age of, of uh, siloed language wars is pretty much over. I think .NET going open source was pretty much the last uh, castle to fall, and, and now it's just, it's not anarchy. It's just an opportunity for everybody. It's like, it's like the opposite anarchy. I don't want to say utopia, but it, it really is. It's a great. And I'm telling you, coming from the strict Microsoft, um, you know, working in a pharmaceutical company for nine years and writing code in VB and C Sharp and ASP.NET and not knowing anything else, and stepping into this open source world, I likened it, 
one time to coming out of your office dressed in a suit, and there's a parade, right? And they're going by, and someone's, you know, pulling the, the floats down, and you're the developer, and the, the Microsoft developer's in the suit, and they're like, I would really like to be out there holding the Batman float, you know? Well, that's what it's like. It's like, it's, it's your opportunity to, like, hey, I don't, it's not, this whole world has opened up to me. And I, I literally have goosebumps now. I get really excited about the idea that we can just all contribute to the same thing, even if it's different languages. I mean, containers. We got containers. We're .NET developers, and we have containers now, today. It's just, sorry, I'm uh, getting on my evangelism thing, but um, I just get psyched up about it. That's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Anybody want another peppermint patty? I've got some up here. That's because I'm from York, Pennsylvania, and they're York peppermint patties, and now every time you have one, I want you to remember this. That's it for me. You guys, we're done. Thank <laughs> you.